then let's define a second function g of x the same way. And let's define that as this derivative. So I'm just copy pasting that whole thing. And let's suppress output from both of these using semicolons just so we don't get too much clutter. And then if we want to see what g of x equals, we type it down here to print the value and shift enter and we get the same thing back. So you can see that we can do that both ways. And then we can also take integrals of functions. Really so fast. Do that. Yeah. Is there a way to say like f prime of x? So like instead of having to copy, you know, say d of the function, could you just say like f prime? Yeah, I believe you can actually type it just like that. Let me just double check f prime of x. Yeah, and so that gives you the first derivative. And I think you can also do second derivative that way. Yeah, and that should give you the same thing. Um, so that notation is a little bit cleaner when you have this function defined. If you don't have a function defined and you just have the expression, you're going to have to use this um, capital D. So in a new line, we can also take an integral. Um, so, oh, and another thing, we used this variable A before. So to reuse that variable, I'm going to use this clear function um, so that it doesn't use the same value of a that we used before, just so I can reuse it. And then to type an integral, it's a special character. So I'm going to type escape and then int for integral. And then for some reason, there's a second t. Um, there's like different types of integrals you can have it display. So with the two t's, um, we press escape again and we get this. And you can see it has a box for you to type your integrand and then a box for the dx or the whatever measure of the integral you're going to use. Okay. And then we want to give the integral bounds. It can do, um, what are they called? The ones with bounds. I'm blanking on my calculus. What are the definite, definite and indefinite integrals? Yeah, it can do either one. Um, but let's do a definite integral. So click before this box with the integrand. So your cursor is between the integral and the box and then press control underscore. And that'll bring you to this lower bound. And let's do it from zero. And then right from there, let's press control five or control percent sign. And that'll bring us to the top where let's have the upper bound be infinity. And so to do that, that's a special character. So we used escape and then infinity is I N F and then escape again. So with our bounds, let's then type the integrand and we're gonna do E with a capital E because it's the number E and then to the power of using control six and then let's do minus A space X squared. And the space is um, there so that it knows AX isn't one variable and it's a times x squared. Um, so this is a famous integral. It's called the Gaussian integral and you'll use it a lot in physics, which is why I chose this example. Um, so if we do dx, we type the x in there and do shift enter, we get that result is square root of pi over two square root of a if the real part of a is greater than zero. Um, so that's a famous one that you'll likely memorize at one point, at some point if you haven't already. Um, and you can see it also gives you conditions on some of the variables in your expression. So it tells you like this a is gonna, its real part is gonna be have to have to be greater than zero to get this value, which is kind of a neat thing that Mathematica can do. All right. So the next thing that I want to talk about. I'm sorry, um, quick question. Um, for multivariable yeah, yeah. stuff, is, is it basically just the same thing um, for like integration differentiation? You just um, add in the y or whatever else you're using? Yeah, so like a double integral? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can give a quick example. Um, so to do that, we'll do the escape INTT again. And then inside that integrand, we do the same thing again escape 
I N T T. And then we have the two integrals and we can give both integration variables. And then we can type whatever we want in our integrand, um, something like that. And then shift enter, it will give us the result that way. And you can do that for as many integrals as you want. Cool. So another neat thing about Mathematica is it has access to the Wolfram Alpha database. So we can call um, like any data from that database to use in our calculations. So as a quick example of that, we're going to calculate how long it takes a cheetah to run across the sun. So we can get the speed of a cheetah and the diameter of the sun from Wolfram Alpha super easily. So let's store this in a variable called x. And then it's going to be a fraction. Um, so we'll use our fraction bar control forward slash. And then we need the diameter of the sun. So to do that, what you do is press control equals. And it'll give you this little environment where you can literally type diameter of the sun. Enter. And it'll think for a second. And my zoom window is covering what I need to click. But then we can press this check. And you can see if it kind of looks like what you want. Yes, the sun is a star and I want its average diameter. Um, you can also click this dot, dot, dot for uh, other ways to interpret what you type. So like it's thinking maybe you wanted an equatorial diameter or polar diameter, but we just wanted the average. So we're going to press check. And then we've got that there. And then for the denominator, we need the speed of a cheetah. So we'll do control equals speed of a cheetah. Enter. Check mark, so that looks like what we want. Cheetah is a species and we want its max speed. Check. And if we do shift enter, fingers crossed, it'll give us some number. Yeah, so it'll take the cheetah 11,527.8 hours to run across the sun. So that's kind of a fun thing you can do. And I think there's only a couple more kind of like just general functions we're going to go over before we get into an actual physics problem and go over a little bit more advanced stuff. So there's just two more functions, I think. Um, this one is called table. So we're going to assign to a value, a variable A, table. And what this does is generate a list. Um, so you may have seen something similar in other coding languages if you've done any, any other programming. Um, how it works in Mathematica is we use these square brackets. And our first argument is the thing that we want a list of. And it will have some kind of variable in it like i or j that we're going to iterate for like i equals 1 through 10 or something like that, kind of like a for loop or something. Um, so let's do, if you remember, we defined this function f of x earlier. I'll scroll back really quickly just to remind you right here we have that. So let's generate a list of its first five derivatives. So to take a derivative we do d of f of x and then for the second argument it's a list. Of, so we're taking the derivative with respect to x i times. So we'll leave that free so that we can iterate it and generate a list. Then for the second argument of the table, it's going to be a list where the first element is um, the iteration variable i. And then we want it to go from 1 to 5. And then there can also be a fourth element in that list if you want to specify the step size. So if we want it to be going from 1 to 5 in steps of 0.1, we could do that. Um, but in this case, the default is 1, which is what we want. So once we have that, we can shift enter. And oh, I think I maybe had something not cleared or something. I must have a variable in here that I've stored as some value. Yeah, it looks like x right now is the uh, time to run around the sun. Yeah, so let's clear x. There we go. And so we have this list that's really messy of the first five derivatives of f. 
Um, so you can generate all that really quickly. Um, and you can also put, if you want to make this a little cleaner, Mathematica can simplify these expressions for you using simplify. And we can put that around the whole list and it'll apply it to each element. And that looks a little bit cleaner. So you can do that really quickly. And then finally, um, let's really quickly evaluate this list at x equals one, just, um, or is that what I used? Yeah, at x equals one, um, just so we get numbers instead of these expressions, because I want to make a plot. So let's do x equals one and suppress the output. And then to generate a, so sorry, um, really quickly, I'll just show you what this does. So if we then print our list that we generated from this table, A, um, and if I put an N around it just so we can see the decimals, we get these five numbers. And to plot that, let's do list plot, where list and plot are both capitalized, and then this list A. And if we shift enter, we get a plot of those five points which is kind of neat. So you can do that really easily for a list of any size. And so unless there are questions, that covers the kind of intro commands we're going to go over. And I'll hand it over to Archana to go over the physics problem we're going to do. Um, so are there any questions till now? Okay. So if there are no questions, let me quickly share my screen. Okay. So do you guys see the Mathematica notebook? So, yep, we're good. Oh, cool. Um, so now we are planning to do an, an actual physics problem with all the commands that we learned right now. Uh, so the idea here is to actually look at the trajectory of a particle as it moves through the Earth's gravitational field. Um, so even before like looking at the trajectory of the particle, just to get an intuition about how the Earth's force would look like. We generally look at the gravitational potential. Um, so from Newton's law of gravity, we know that a uh, value of the gravitational potential on Earth uh, is, is gm by r. Uh, and we know that the constant, the gravitational constant is 6.6 .6 into 10 raised to minus 11. If you think about the mass of the Earth in some units to be one, we can make a plot of the gravitational potential of Earth. So in Mathematica, there is this nice routine called plot 3D, which we use for plots. Um, the good thing about Mathematica is that it's generally very interactive. So if we just hover our mouse over this routine, and if we click on this arrow, we can easily see what are the expressions that it needs. Um, so here we are plotting this gravitational potential, which is minus gm by r. There's a minus sign here because it's an attractive. So if we type this in and shift enter, we should see this plot. So here we have a three-dimensional plot. Um, so basically we are plotting this function gm by r. We can specify the x range, which is seen here. Um, and I specified minus 10 to 10. And similarly, the y range from minus 10 to 10 again. Um, and then we put the plot. So we can actually give the plot range for the value of the function, but then if, Mathematica is generally fairly intuitive about the plot ranges. So there's this option called automatic, which uh, where Mathematica decides which will be the optimal plot range. 
and then you can give the labels for the plots and the axis as well. Okay, so are there any questions? So here we see the gravitational potential of a, a point mass, uh, which is from this plot, it's pretty clear that if the if the force at the center, like if the if the if you have the mass at the center, the force very close to it is it's close to infinity. And as we go far away, it reduces, which is very clear from the plot. So one of the main things that we use Mathematica for is visualization. Um, and that's why these three dimensional plots are pretty useful. Uh, so after this, we go to the next step where we actually look at the trajectory of a, of a particle in the Earth's gravitational field. So we first clear the value of x because we've here we've specified the values of x, so we have to clear that variable by using this function clear x. Um, and then again, if we think about the mass of the particle to be one in some units, and we know that the Earth's gravitational acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. And then when, when a particle moves in the gravitational field of Earth, there is also resistance uh, due to air resistance. And if you think about alpha, the coefficient of resistance, when we give it some random value of three. So the motion of the particle is basically this equation. If no one remembers this, it's fine. We can just think of this as a second order uh, second order differential equation where mass times acceleration is equal to the Earth's gravitational field times alpha times the velocity, which is the first derivative of the position. Um, and we solve this routine in Mathematica called ND solve. Um, so again, if we, um, so if I just press shift enter here, so this, uh, whenever we don't know what a routine actually does, it's uh, an easy way to know that is just having this question mark here, or we can also hover our mouse over this and then find out what this routine exactly does. So if I, if I do this, then what I see is this ND solve requires an equation, and then it also requires the initial conditions and the minimum and maximum values. So here I supply it with this function, which is what I want to solve. Um, m times the second derivative of x is equal to the minus m times the gravitational field of the Earth minus alpha times the first derivative of x. And then we give it the initial condition, uh, which is x of 0 is equal to 0 and the first derivative of x is equal to 5. And then we tell it that we have to solve for x of t and we give it the range of t's, which is from 0 to 1. And then I evaluate this expression and this is what I get. So basically uh, this tells you the value of x between these points, t is equal to zero to one. And then if you click on this, it'll tell you some, these are some technical details that actually, uh, that tells you what Mathematica used to solve this. Uh, so basically whenever there's a function in order to plot a function, you need an interpolating. Um, polynomial. And so it just gives you the technical details of what Mathematica actually did. Okay. So um, any questions still now? Yeah, quick question is, is there a way, um, or does Mathematica have a like a built-in function to plot the results of a knee solve? Like if you wanted to plot the face portrait of a system of many years? Uh, like, can you repeat your question? Sorry. Yeah, so is, is, there, is, is there a function to like, um, to like plot the results of Indy solve? Like if you wanted to plot um, like the face portrait for a system of ODEs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, I guess that's where we are going next, where we can actually plot the 
Um, so basically in the next step, I'll be telling you how to plot it. So you just want to plot this function, right? The solution. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's where we next. Yeah. And um, does, does the same plotting thing work for like a system with equations, not just one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can have like multivariable uh, solutions as well. You just have to give it the required initial conditions so that it's solvable. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, okay, so, so next we'll plot the function. Um, so here, this expression is basically substitution expression where we have, uh, we know x of t and then we we actually substitute x of t at the solution points because over here we've mentioned this variable sol is equal to nd sol. So this sol actually holds all the solutions and now we are substituting x of t with sol. So because of that, you get these x of t's as a, basically as a table of different points and then you plot it using the plot function. So this plot function is very similar to the plot 3D function that we had earlier, just that this one is one dimensional. Uh, and then you plot X of T at these solutions and with this range of T is equal to zero to one. And then optionally, we can give it a label as well. So when you do that, we find this plot of the trajectory where in the X axis, we have the different T's and in the Y axis, we have the different X's. So, yeah. so similarly, there can also be plot 2D functions where, where you have two dimensional and uh, other plots. And then I think there are some higher dimensional plots as well, but I'm not that familiar with it. You can also um, do a, sorry, just interrupt really quickly. There's a density plot. So like you can plot in 3D. So if it's like a function of three variables, um, it'll plot like colors in 3D space and like their density is the value of the function at that point. Right. And then I guess like you can also do phase space plots and different things like that. Um, okay. So next, we'll actually try to get uh, another plot of the, so, so depending on the air resistance, which is alpha here, uh, we have different kind, the motion of the particle would look different depending on the coefficient of resistance, basically. Uh, so in order to see, we can have another kind of plot, which is, called, uh, which is the animated version of the plot. So in order to do that, for we clear out the variables, which is given by this clear solution and clear alpha. Uh, and then we get a table of different solutions for different values of alpha. So basically in this, if you look at this ND solve here, we give it a function similar to the one that we had before. And then we give it the initial conditions here. And then uh, we plot, uh, and we solve for x of t for different values of t. And we pass this into a table for different a, for different alphas. Um, so for a table, as Luke mentioned earlier, we can give it an, an initial point, a final point, and the increments. So this is what this does. And we pass this into a table. And so sol is basically now a, a table of solutions for different values alpha. And then we can we can input that table into this function called animate. Again, like if we don't know about animate, we can always just click on this and then help or so if you have the help option, it'll tell you exactly. It'll give you some examples and it'll uh, mathematically tell you exactly what, what you can do with it. So going back to my other window. Um, so and so then we pass this table of solutions to this function called animate, and we get thing like we get something like this, where this is an animated plot for different alphas. So there are different things that we can do with it. Suppose if I pause this here, we can see that the trajectory it goes up, and then at some 
highest point and it goes down. So as so since we're increasing alpha as we're going forward, um, the air distance basically increases. Because of that, we see that the highest point that the object reaches is goes let it becomes less and less because the air resistance is way more uh, than at some it just becomes almost flat. And so like we can we can actually plot many different things. Visualization is one of the most important things that Mathematica are looking at. Um, yeah, and I guess with that, uh, are there any questions so far? I guess not. Um, so I guess uh, with this basic intro to Mathematica, what let me it just gives you a small Mathematica. The important thing is that there are, the documentation for math is so good. You can always just up at help or just search on the Wolfram website and they give you a really good examples of what you can solve for different things. Okay then. Um, so I guess I'll pass on Luke next to talk about LaTeX. Yeah. Um, so now that we have these results in Mathematica, what we're going to try to do is create a little document in LaTeX um, using overleaf.com. Overleaf is kind of like the Google Drive of LaTeX. You can share your tech files with people and collaborate um, and also render them as PDFs side by side, um, all in the cloud. So it's kind of convenient. Um, there are also offline LaTeX editors that you can download. I think there's one called Tech Studio. Um, and some people prefer those. I pre personally prefer having everything stored in the cloud um, and the collaboration is nice. So I use Overleaf and a lot of other people do too. Um, so before moving into the Overleaf, um, if you still have the notebook open, um, we're gonna go back and save a couple of these figures that we've generated as images. So then we can then import them into Overleaf and have them in our document, just to show you how to do that. So um, let me share my screen. So for example, let's take this plot. Yeah, can everyone see my screen okay? Yep. Okay, um, so let's take this plot of the gravitational potential. And if we right click and press save graphic as, um, you can go to wherever you wanna save it, give it whatever name um, and save it as a PNG. Um, I already have it saved, so I'm not gonna do it again, but you can do that, save it wherever you'd like. Um, and then I'm gonna move over to the overleaf. Give me one second to switch the window that I'm sharing. Okay. So this is what overleaf.com looks like. I'm going to exit out of here really quickly to show you from the beginning. Um, so if you could log into your overleaf account, um, I'm already logged in here. And if you go to projects, which you should have a button for projects in the top right, It'll give you a list of all of your projects you've done. If you haven't done any, this will just be blank. But then we can press new project, blank project, and we give it a name, um, just like trajectories or something, and then create. And then it'll open something like this. And then if you press these arrows in the top right, it'll split screen so you can see the PDF in your code side by side. Um, I'm actually going to exit out of this project and go into the one that I already have complete so I can walk you guys through it. Um, what you guys can do is we've sent you this code here as a text file in that email. And if you want to just copy paste that into, so make sure you control A and delete everything that it default gives you and then paste in the text that we've sent you. Um, that should make our lives a little bit easier. Um, or if you want to just type it as we're going, that's fine as well. So what we have here is 
at the top, you specify the type of document that you want to create with document class. Um, so a lot of LaTeX syntax is a little more complicated than Mathematica and difficult to remember. Um, so I personally don't really remember barely anything that you use in LaTeX. I always copy and paste. I have like a project saved on Overleaf that I have as like my template. And then I always just create a copy of that whenever I'm starting a new document. So I don't have to remember everything. So usually I'll just copy and paste this line, um, but it tells you we want an article with 12 point font. Sometimes you'll change that um, for specific purposes, but usually you can just leave that as is. And then these next eight or so lines, um, we have different packages that we're importing. And I have commented a little description of each one in case you're interested, um, but I always use the same set of packages. Um, they allow for different functions that you can use. I have this physics one, which I don't know how common this one is, but um, it's obviously good for physics. It has like a lot of um, physics notation, math notation um, that you can use more easily. So it's kind of nice. Um, yeah, and then you type this line, begin document, and that'll start the actual document. Then after that, we include a title. And so I've just written something to describe kind of what we're doing here. And then you'll have your author, and then you'll have your date. And you can either use this command today, or you can actually type a date like November 5, 2020. Either way will work. Um, today tries to update based on what the day is, but sometimes I found it gets it wrong. Um, and there are other issues that can come with it. Um, so it depends on your preference there. Then we create an abstract with begin abstract, and then we type it in here. Um, I think that LaTeX doesn't care about white space, um, but just for formatting reasons, it'll automatically give you this, um, this white space here inside the abstract environment just to make it look a little bit cleaner. Um, so you type your abstract in here and then we'll also end the environment. And then if you look on the PDF side, that's this section here um, and it'll label, label it as your abstract. Um, you pretty much always wanna include an abstract, maybe not for like certain prob problem sets or things, but for any kind of paper re review or anything you want an abstract. Then we start our first section of the document with section and then we give it a title. And then you can just start typing your text wherever. And you'll notice here I have this M between dollar signs. What that does is it tells LaTeX that this is a mathematical symbol. And so it'll format it differently um, like it's math. So in this case, it'll just italicize it, but you can also insert like special characters and fraction bars and things that way. So that's something useful to know. Um, if you look over in the PDF, um, this M is italicized. So that's what the dollar signs are doing. Um, that's for inline math, for like base math, like for a separate equation, if you wanted to have an equation number and you wanna highlight it, you'll use this equation environment and then you'll also give it a label. That way you can reference the equation throughout your document. Um, and I don't think I have an example of that in here, but I'll add one really quickly to show you how that works. Um, I'll just type another sentence right here. Um, look at equation. And then what you do is type backslash ref curly braces and then it'll give you some options for equations you have in the document, which is nice. Um, that's something Overleaf does that offline tech editors can't do. So I can just type, click on this one because that's what I've labeled this equation. And then I'll just put a period or an exclamation mark for fun. And if we recompile our PDF, what we'll see is that that equation has um, a blue one so the one is the equation number. And if we click on the blue, it's a hyperlink. And that hyperlink will be there in the PDF that you download afterwards as well. Um, so if we click on that, it'll jump to the equation um, that we reference. 
So moving on, um, you can also insert a figure using this figure environment. And then I'm not even sure I know what all of these things are. I always copy paste this. Um, but I think you need each of these lines and you can mess with this width here. Um, right now it's on 1.0, but you can make it anywhere from zero to one. Um, and that just is the width of the figure on your page. And then you give a label to your figure, just like we did for the equation here. You can reference it in the same way. And then we want to give it a caption um, and you just type that in here. And LaTeX will, will put your figure wherever it thinks it fits best. So in this case, it'll put it on the second page just because that's what it's decided. If you decide that you don't like where LaTeX put your figure, um, it's usually too bad for you. You can't really do anything about it. And that's what your professors will tell you. Um, I think if you really try, you can move it where you want, but it's pretty difficult. And we usually just learn to accept LaTeX um, will decide for us. Yeah, I think you can define the position on a page, but then it's pretty difficult. You can give yeah. it position there. Yeah. Um, the one thing you can do is you can make sure it's centered on this page on the page using this um, centering command. I always like to include that. Sometimes it'll be a little off center, otherwise. Um, and then I have some more text here, and I've used this site command. Um, so what's going on here is I have a bibliography below um, in this bibliography environment, and to have an item in your bibliography, you use bib item and then you give your citation a name. So I have this really complicated looking name here um, that you can name it whatever you want. I have this weird looking name because I got this citation from Inspire, which is a physics database with lots of papers. And if you go to Inspire, um, you can get your citation straight from the paper. You can just click export citation and it allow you to copy and paste something and it'll give you a name for the citation, which is why I have this. And the reason that's useful is if you're collaborating with people and you're all including your own citations um, and you've given different names to the same citation, it'll include the same citation multiple times. So if you're all using a standard name for it from whatever database you're using, um, it'll know to include it only once. Um, so I have that here and then you use cite and then the name of the citation. And if we look at our PDF, um, where I cited it, um, it says C1, and that'll also reference the point in the bibliography where that citation is. Yeah, so that's pretty much all we've gotten here. Um, there's a lot you can do with LaTeX. Um, you can just look it up. A lot of it, like I said, is um, a little bit more difficult to memorize. So you just end up copy pasting a lot of stuff and looking things up. Um, but it creates some really pretty documents. Um, you can download this with this button here and you get a PDF downloaded. They can do whatever you want with it and it'll be in color and have all the hyperlinks in there. Um, and it automatically does like page numbers and formatting and everything. So it's pretty convenient um, once you get the hang of it and you will have to use it likely in research or in classes. Um, so do we have any questions about the LaTeX or Overleaf? Yeah, I had a question about Overleaf. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious, like when you share a document with someone, do you see like the changes that other people have made in like real time, like you would see in Google Docs or do you have to like keep refreshing in order to see like um, the changes different people have made? Yeah, it's very similar to Google Drive. Um, you'll see like there'll be a little icon with the first letter of people's names for like who's in the document at the same time as you. And you'll like see where their cursor is and you'll see changes in the code in real time. Um, you will have to recompile on your own, but you have to do that even when you're working by yourself. It doesn't just automatically update the PDF as you're changing the code. Um, but yeah, it's really similar to Google Drive. I do think there's a limit to the number of people you can collaborate with on a free account with Overleaf. They might be doing like a um, COVID um, offer for like a paid account for
for less or free or something right now. Um, I know I'm for my research, I'm working with two other people and we're collaborating on an overlease document. I had to like give them a referral link that like, since I like referred a friend to overlease, it let me have more collaborators. Um, so you can look that up if you're interested, interested in doing that. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if you said this, Luke, uh, but for you had the photo or like the image, the visualization that you wanted to include, you had to upload that to the document. Um, right. I, that's pretty intuitive. They have a nice UI. Yeah, I can go over that really quickly. Um, yeah, so to upload that image, um, I had to save that from the Mathematica notebook. What you do is there's this icon right here to upload and then you can drag it or select from your computer. Um, and then you just go through your file explorer and click on whatever image and it'll upload it. Um, and then you'll have your list of all of your images and things over here on the left and you can click on them. So this is the PNG that I have uploaded to Overleaf. And then this is just the tech file. And then you can have other things as well. And you can also like delete them or rename them and things. And so when I created the figure um, here, I had to type the name of the file that I uploaded to get that to render. Any other questions? If not, it looks like we're almost just on time, just a couple minutes over. Oh yeah, um, there's a Google Drive extension called, or is that the, there's another one for um, for Google Drive called like Auto Latex. Do you remember what it was called, Archana? Yeah, I don't, I, I think it was something like Auto Latex, but yeah, I don't remember exactly. But yeah, generally for PowerPoint presentations and stuff, people use something called latex it where you can write your equations on latex because it looks good um, and then just paste it yeah um, i just looked it up i think it was called um, auto latex equations mm -hmm. so you can use that in google drive um, and then the one you were just talking about for like powerpoints and things yeah um, thank you everyone for coming um, if you have any more questions, you can always email the developer student club email. You can always look back at the those two documents we sent you in the email, the notebook and the LaTeX file. Um, there's going to be an exit survey emailed to you, and it would be really helpful to us if you could fill it out just to get your feedback. Um, and we're going to post a recording of the event as well. So unless there's anything else, that's all I have. Thank you. Where are you guys coming. posting the recording? Um, so we're going to send you an email uh, to the same one that you signed up with, and it'll link to oh, our cool. YouTube account. Oh, cool. Um, and also, you can, if you're there, you can look out. We've had other lessons this semester, and we'll post additional lessons there. Um, and they'll also have the materials link. So if you want to follow along with an event that already happened, revisit this one um, or next semester. And just one more thing to add to Luke's point about the exit survey. Um, we're starting already to plan for our events for next semester. So if you like this one or you hoped you could have learned something else, um, your feedback is really important. I think already we're gonna be doing some pretty cool machine learning stuff, um, doing like basics with Keras and that kind of thing. So um, if that sounds interesting or you would like something else, it's really would be super awesome if you could fill out that survey. So thank you guys. Yeah, so I, I mean, we'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone wants to ask anything, but I think everyone's good to go if there's no other questions.